Okay. Series on owner exploration. Um, with our favorite investors, Ann Green and Brandon University. Uh, I, I, know, I know most of you, but I'm Lisa Gowling, I'm the library director. Uh, but I just also want to, as I always do, thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring this program and for providing all the nice brownies and goodies. <laughs> and next week is part four. And I know the past are in the Super Bowl, but it would be kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> President's Day weekend. So we will conclude uh, at the weekend after that, which I think is a Wednesday. Yes. Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, that I'll announce it again next week. Thank you. Okay, okay welcome, everybody. Uh, great to see you again, as always. And as always, if you feel like stretching and getting up and getting down, you won't bother me. This is uh, maybe going to be, I hope not a little too much on the long side. There's a lot to say on this one, but uh, I'll try to keep it reasonably short. And again, if you do feel yourself getting tired, uh, by all means, refresh yourself uh, off there to the left. Uh, last time we uh, gathered, we talked about the famous Discovery Expedition led by Robert Falcon Scott that set a brand new further south record, uh, a little bit over 82 degrees south. And we also saw that Scott returned to England a great hero after this marvelous achievement, a testament but many people thought to what members of the British Empire still could achieve, even though perhaps their fortunes were at a low ebb after the Boer War. But one person left unsatisfied after all this was the, uh, the second of the three members of the party that Scott took to 82 degrees south, 1902-1903, uh, and that was Bernard Shackleton. And that Shackleton had come back to England bristling under the suggestion that somehow he had failed to pull his own weight on that expedition, and it actually, on certain occasions, had to ride on the sledges back to safety after they had achieved the farthest south. And he was determined to prove himself as somebody who had not been slacking off during that expedition, somebody who in fact was worthy of all the accolades that Scott had gotten. And he decided to devote himself shortly after getting married to Emily uh, upon his return to England to trying to raise money for his own expedition to Antarctica. He had been bitten by the South Polar bug. He desperately wanted to get to the South Pole, the first to ever do that. His problem, though, was he wasn't going to get any official British government support because the establishment in England was all in favor of Scott. If anybody was going to get official support, it was going to be Scott when he cared to go back, maybe 1908, 1909, uh, somewhere along in there. So Shackleton would have to steal a march on Scott, raising his own money to try to get to the pole by 1907. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, here we have uh, Bernard Shackleton, uh, all the time knowing that he had a bad heart and that any step in polar regions could theoretically be his last. But he was going to go anyway, and he was very lucky that Emily was not going to stand in his way. They were newly married. She was now a mother. She had plenty of responsibilities. But she never told Shackleton you can't go. She knew that was in his blood, and that uh, Shackleton wouldn't be Shackleton if he didn't actually make the attempt. Now, what he really had going for him was his personality. He was likable. He was outgoing. He told a great story. Almost everybody felt compelled by Shackleton. If anybody could raise the money and get people to trust him, it was probably Bernard Shackleton. Emily used to say that they would go into a restaurant and everybody else at the tables would be clicking their fingers, waiter, waiter, waiter. All Shackleton had to do was sit down, lift up his head, and the waiters would come running. He was that kind of personality. And he tucked himself in to a pretty good job as a, what we would say, a public relations guy to a Scottish industrialist named Beardsmore. He had actually gotten to know Beardsmore's, uh, Beardsmore's wife, Eliza, and through Eliza, he got this wonderful job, paid him pretty well, but what it really did was give him access to Beersmore to try to persuade him into putting up some of the money for the expedition. Beersmore saw fit to trust Shackleton and decided to pledge 7,000 pounds by way of guaranteed loans to help him get started funding this expedition. Why would he trust Shackleton? It had to do with his personality. There are all sorts of reasons to think that was a bad investment, a 7,000 pound guaranteed loan. Shackleton was not that good with money. Uh, as people in Beersports, our firm, were always saying, months would go by and he'd forget to pick up his salary. 
Uh, a one time he forgot for five months to pick up his salary. Uh, it feels like Emily thought about this sort of thing. So he was not a financial wizard, but he had that personality. Uh, he talked fears more uh, into putting up the money. Uh, and then he began to try to gather a crew. He really wanted Billy Wilson to go. Uh, the third member of the party to get the 82 degrees self uh, with Scott. But uh, Wilson was pledged to, to Scott. He wasn't going to go with Shackleton. And anyway, Billy Wilson was up in the north of England trying to figure out the cause of a disease that was killing off the grouse up there. Uh, so for the time being, he didn't know the time or the inclination. And so uh, Shackleton had to do the best he could, finding people here and there, and especially trying to find a ship. What kind of ship was he going to get to go down there? It can't be a Royal Naval vessel. can't be anything official. So he finally found, after a great deal of effort, uh, an old vessel. I think uh, the next slide uh, will show the next slide after that. Uh, this vessel here, uh, this thing was 50 years old, half the size of the Discovery. It was dilapidated. It was filthy. It stank of seal oil because it was always a seal hunting vessel. And this is the Nimrod. And that's the ship he was able to get for 5,000 pounds. He always meant to change the name from Nimrod because he thought a good name for a vessel would be the Endurance. And that would eventually be his vessel. But he never got around to changing the name of this one. Uh, so it would remain the Nimrod. And that's why everything is called the Nimrod Expedition from here on out. Now, now we can go to the previous slide uh, for just a second, oh, uh, the prior one. And remember that uh, as Shackleton was planning this, Borrowing money here, he went to the Guinness family in Dublin, got some money from them, borrowing money wherever he could find it, raising the money as best he could. Uh, Scott in the Royal Geographic Society got wind of what he was up to, that he was going to go to the South Pole. And that's when Scott wrote Shackleton a famous letter demanding that Shackleton not go to McMurdo, which after all was Scott's base, and Scott thought that he had proprietary interest in that base. Uh, McMurdo is over here. Uh, for which Scott Shackleton Wilson had set out in 1902. So Shackleton had to promise that in this expedition with the Nimrod, they would only set forth to the South Pole from somewhere around there. Not quite as advantageous, but they had landed there to put up that balloon we heard about last week. Shackleton knew something about that land that was Edward the Seventh Land, and so he promised that that's what his base would be. So with that promise, he set about hiring more crew. Very interestingly, among other things, uh, he would talk to this geologist he thought might come aboard. And the question Shackleton had for the geologist was, can you sing? <laughs> now, it would never ever occur to Scott to ask somebody, can you sing, before taking them on the ship. But that was the kind of guy Shackleton was. He wanted to know your personality. He wanted to know if you were the sort who could withstand these conditions. Whatever your expertise, it was the strength of personality that really interested Shackleton. And ultimately, he did sign on a pretty good crew, uh, among them a doctor that we'll see a little bit later, Dr. Marshall, who was determined that nobody would suffer from scurvy and that the men would not be squeamish about eating penguin meat and seal meat and all the things that would keep you from that great disease as time went on. He began to load up the Nimrod. Uh, he found a printing press because he had learned on the Discovery Expedition that one way to keep morale going in the dark winter months was to print up a newsletter, and he wanted to do that again. So he's going to have his own printing press. Uh, he was going to have 30 sleds that would help him try to get to the South Pole. When the time came, he was going to have plenty of building materials. He was going to have a movie camera. I think a few movies down there because he anticipated a lecture tour eventually from which he might be able to make back some of the money. He was something to put on. He was going way into that. A bunch of this stuff had to be paid back even before he left. He couldn't pay any of it back. But this was Shackleton. He always just thought about tomorrow. Everything's got to be fine. I just have to get down there, and the future will take care of itself. Now, he made a couple of big mistakes, though, as he was planning the expedition. The one thing he did right was he went to talk to the expert, the ambassador to Great Britain from Norway, the great Fridtjof Nansen, who knew everything about polar travel, first one to travel across the Greenland ice cap. He went to talk to Nansen. Nansen told him three things. Uh, these are the first two. Take dogs. You're not going to get there without dogs. Take skis. You're not going to get there without skis. Shackleton ignored this advice. He just took a few skis, not really enough. And he only took, I think, nine dogs. He wasn't planning to get to the pole with dogs. Now we go to the next slide. 
uh, finally, his idea was to uh, load up the Nimrod, next slide, with ponies. Uh, he was going to have ponies pull the sled, specifically these sturdy Manchurian ponies, some of which you see here. Uh, a dreadfully bad decision, as we'll see in a little while. Why wouldn't Shackleton just listen to Nansen, who knew what he was talking about? There's a third piece of advice we'll get to a little bit later that he also ignored. And, and the only answer to me would have to be that Shackleton was Anglo-Irish, British Isles character. Uh, he thought that nobody could learn anything from anybody else if you were from the British Isles. So he ignored this advice, and the Manchurian ponies would be the way to go, uh, even though he had no idea nor did anybody else on this expedition. We can predict how this is going to go. Now, if we go to the next slide. Now, here's what he did say. He took a car. Now, what is now Pierce Moore was putting up all this money uh, to go to Antarctica, and Pierce Moore thought this would be a nice publicity stunt because Pierce Moore had some money invested in this company in Scotland that was producing these cars. So that's an Athol Johnston motor car. And Shackleton didn't actually think he could drive to the South Pole. That he wasn't thinking that. He thought maybe there'll be a some use. Anyway, this would get people talking about the expedition. Maybe this would help raise money. And so he agreed to take that along too on what was rapidly becoming the dangerously overloaded Nimrod. But they were finally ready to go. Now, it's record time. He's going to do this in record time. And it's six months of planning, getting the crew, getting the ship. Uh, it is now July of 1907, the Antarctic winter. And he's ready to leave England once more. Queen Alexandra and King Edward VII came aboard the ship to say goodbye. Uh, this time, Queen Alexandra knew better than to take her dog along. Uh, so she did give them a flag, as we'll see later, hopefully to plant at the South Pole. Uh, and then they said goodbye. Shackleton eluded a few of his debts, escaping before somebody could actually collect them. Uh, but he figured all is going to be fine. I'll make 30 pounds eventually, 30,000 pounds. Uh, on a, a lecture tour, I'll sell my book. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, and off they went. Their first stop was going to be Australia and New Zealand, maybe to recruit more crew, maybe to raise some more money. And just to give you a, another indication of the kind of guy Shackleton was, really a usual personality. He did give a bunch of lectures in Sydney while they were waiting to go down to Antarctica. And the lectures were well attended, and people gave money, and they applauded. And Shackleton, in the course of his delight and gratitude, took the money that he needed for the expedition and just gave it to Sherry. Uh, <laughs> spur of the moment, uh, because he felt that was the right thing to do. Uh, and then finally, after taking on some very important crew members, who we'll meet in a little while, the Nimrod was ready to go from New Zealand. 50,000 people turned out to Christchurch uh, to say goodbye. One of the biggest gatherings in the history of New Zealand, a big occasion, uh, and they soon figured out uh, that the Nimrod wasn't gonna go anywhere because it was so overloaded, there was no room for all the coal they were going to need to get to Antarctica and back. Uh, so what they were going to have to do is tow the Nimrod uh, from another ship, at least as far as Antarctica, so they could unload everybody and get going before the ice set. So here's what they got to do. They loaded up the Nimrod, those of you who are all salts, uh, you know about the Plimsoll line. Uh, the Plimsoll line is the line in every merchant vessel that should never be below the water line, it should always be above the water line. So you never load up a vessel so the Plimsoll line is below the water. But this Plimsoll line was way below uh, the water. This was really dangerous. So they decided that this thing was going to be towed. So the, a ship begins towing the Nimrod from New Zealand to Antarctica. And pretty soon they got in the Great Southern Ocean. And pretty soon a terrible gale came up. Uh, and pretty soon the ship was being blown this way and that, more than 50 degrees this way, 50 degrees that way. Um, the author Randall Fines, who's written a fine biography of Shackleton, compares this to a tumble dryer. Everybody's going against the walls. And the poor ponies, everybody was worried the ponies were going to be drowned. Water was going in everywhere. And the ponies were slamming up against their stalls. And, and nobody has seen them. For 10 days, the storm raged. And the, the sailors on the ship, many of them had been across the world on the ocean, uh, they were seasick. Some of the, the, the most seasoned sailors were seasick. They called their quarters Oyster Alley. Uh, maybe because that's what they were throwing up. Maybe because it was so slippery, it was like oysters. I, but that's what they were And some of them were superstitious. They blamed Frank Wilde, one of the early recruits on this expedition, for including an albatross. 
Maybe that's what was causing the game. Bad luck. You shoot an al albatross, maybe you, you get what's coming to you. Uh, but somehow they got through the Southern Ocean and they got to the point where they were supposed to land. King Edward VII land, sometimes called by then the Bay of Wales. Now we go to the next slide. And uh, pretty soon they found that, and this is your slide. Uh, we have uh, the, the friends back there, uh, Joel and Elaine, right? Uh, so they went to Antarctica. This is kind of a picture of, of Antarctica and uh, a little bit of the way it looks. This is the kind of site they would have seen as they approached King Edward VII land. And now my favorite slide is the next slide. Here's the old, uh, there you are. But they wouldn't have seen all these penguins not a last, but I have a little joke. So those are I don't have perfect. No, because we never saw oh yeah, you never wanted to see what's coming. Yes, I think I really, really like that picture. And now we go to the next slide. Uh, so here, so they they, uh, they got the King Edward the Seventh plan, and, and they soon found that conditions had changed since Shackleton was there uh, in the earlier part of the 19 aughts. They couldn't land there. He tried to land there. He tried to keep his word to Scott, but it was no doing. No way to land there. So what they had to do was go back across the ice shelf to the Southern Ocean, and they had to go back to McMurdo, which was near Scott's base, and they decided that ideally they would land here at what they call Hot Point. That's where McMurdo Station is now. That's the part of the south you can go on Ross Island. But they couldn't quite get there. And they finally decided they had to land, if they were going to land at all on Ross Island here on Cape Royds. That's where they were trying to land. And that happens to be the southernmost rookery of Adelie penguins in the world, although they didn't know that then. And as they were trying to land, they almost killed the captain. The entire crew hated the captain. They thought he was too cautious. He never quite got close enough so they could unload the supplies comfortably and get on to Cape Royce. He's always pulling back, then going a little bit further and pulling back. Uh, if this had been legal, they surely would have killed this guy. Uh, and at one point, Shackleton actually ordered England, who was the captain, full speed ahead, full speed ahead. And England yelled at Shackleton, full speed to stern, full speed to stern. Uh, what do you do if you're in a battle? What do you do? You listen to Shackleton or you listen to England? Uh, well, he was the captain. Eventually, he prevailed. It took them way longer than it should have to unload everything on Cape Royce. But again, this is where they were, uh, the, the farthest to the west on Ross Island. Uh, not really like to be, but that's about as good as they're going to do. So now we go to the next slide. It is now uh, late February. Uh, uh, 19, uh, 1908 now, and uh, they built this hut, as you see here, on Cape Royds. I think it's uh, 33 feet by 19 feet, if I remember, yeah, 33 by 19, and that's where they were going to spend the winter. And then in the Antarctic summer, uh, late 1908, they were going to try to get to the South Pole. That's, that's the idea. But they had one thing to do before they settled in for the winter, and it's a testament to the kind of guy Shackleton was. That even though they had all sorts of months of darkness ahead of them, while there was still light, he wanted to do something. He wanted to do something. They can't get anywhere near the pole. It's way too late for that. But maybe there's something they can do. And the idea was let's try to climb Mount Erebus. So Mount Erebus, if you go to the next slide, uh, had been known, had been known uh, since uh, James Clark Ross had been in Antarctic waters in the 1840s. People had commented on his beauty. They knew it was a, an old volcano, but nobody had ever climbed. And so Shackleton sent a party up there to try to climb. First time on Mount Erebus. This is March of 1908, still light, still okay out there. It did not matter that nobody had any climbing experience. <laughs> it did not matter that nobody had any climbing equipment. It did not matter that they didn't think to take poles along with them so they could set up tents on the mountain as they climbed up to nearly 13,000 feet on this peak. But the men who did it, if anybody could do it, they were the ones. Uh, two of them were the Australians that had been taken on board the Nimrod in Sydney. One who would be really famous later on, we'll get to him during our last presentation, the great Sir Douglas Mawson, uh, only 20 years old here. And the other is a professor whom everybody liked, uh, uh, Sir Edward, Edward David, a geologist. And they were among the party that began to climb Mount Erebus. 
It's 34 degrees below zero. The wind is so loud they can't hear each other in their sleeping bags. They've got no poles for the tents. So on the slopes in freezing cold, they put themselves in sleeping bags and they took the tent canvas and they put it over them for a little bit more warmth, uh, otherwise exposed to the elements on this mountain. And eventually up they go, it took them five days, up they go, up they go. And they finally got to the very top of the mountain in a horrible freezing conditions, but it was all worth it because they could look out for Mount Erebus, the climbing party that went up there, not Shackleton, but, but others did get up there. And they saw over here McMurdo Sound, and off in the distance was the Great Southern Ocean, and off behind them was the Ross Ice Shelf, and right below them, the hissing crater of this volcano, steam coming up all the time. It was an unforgettable sight, the first ascent of Mount Erebus. And when they got back, a delighted Shackleton cracked open the champagne, and they had a big party as they began to settle in for the long winter. Nobody was better in the winter than Shackleton. Uh, he began to have everybody contribute to the first book ever published in Antarctica uh, <laughs> called the, he called it uh, Aurora Australis. Uh, all 14 members of the party got to contribute essays to this. They had a newsletter, they had fun, they had games, they had plays. And Shackleton was always ready with a story. It didn't matter how dispirited anybody was. There was always a story he could tell to lift everybody up. Uh, he was born to do this kind of thing. Uh, a natural leader, not the best planner, but certainly a natural leader of men. And finally, as the winter progressed, they were ready to think about the polar journey. But in thinking about that, they had one really bad fact they had to contend with. And that is not long after they landed at Cape Royds. What happened was they took the remaining ponies off the ship. Uh, there was only about a nine or 10 left. And four of them died, five of them died right away because they had been clumsily tethered near the shore. And they'd eaten sand, volcanic sand, because it tasted like salt to them. There was salt water, of course, mixed in all the time. And that was enough to kill, I think, five of the ponies. And when they cut them open for the meat, they found uh, 12 pounds of sand in the stomach of those four ponies. Oh my God. So they were gonna be able to make the trip. There were now only four ponies left for the journey to the pole. It's really not enough. But they were going to have one pony per sled or four sleds on the way to try to ultimately get to the bottom of the earth. Now, what about the car? I bet you'll be shocked to hear that the car was no use. Uh, they actually thought this thing to go about 11 miles around Ross Island, but it's not going to go any further than that. The carburetor wouldn't work, uh, and so they had to forget the whole thing. But the winter at least was over. They had four ponies left. They had four men who had tried to get to the South Pole beginning in October. Their names are, as we'll see in a little while, uh, Jameson Adams, Frank Weil, the doctor, Dr. Marshall, and Shackleton himself. They would, they would start for the pole on October 29th, 1908. And as they were beginning to get ready, Shackleton wrote one last letter home to Emily, and he called her Sweet Eyes. That was his pet name for Emily, Sweet Eyes. And he wrote to Sweet Eyes and he said, quote, your husband, uh, if, if I don't come back, here's what you can always know. Your husband died in one of the few things left that remain to be done. You take solace in that. I died in one of the few things left that remains to be done, getting to the South Pole. So those four men would try it. Frank Wilde had been on the Discovery Expedition, pretty experienced hand when it came to the polar matters. Marshall, a, a good doctor, uh, uh, James, James and Adams was a, a Royal Navy officer, and Shackleton himself, of course, was Shackleton. That's all that we need. Well, we hope that's what we need. Uh, and so down, as everybody waved goodbye, off Ross Island and onto the ice shelf, they went. Maybe now we go to the next slide. Here are the ponies, by the way. Uh, these are the four ponies, uh, and they all had names, of course. Uh, we'll talk about one of the names as we go along. But you can see they're not very big, and they weren't shot. Nobody thought to put horseshoes on these ponies uh, with results like that we're about to see. Oh now we go to the next slide. So the idea is to start here, uh, that's Ross Island, and then I will go across the ice shelf. Very helpfully, this map is in Russian. Uh, <laughs> and at some point, they hope to get past Scott, Shackleton's, and uh, Wilson's farther south around there. And after that, they didn't know what to expect. They knew there were mountains, 
but they didn't know how they how high they were, and they didn't know what was beyond the mountains. As far as they knew, there could be a big lake beyond the mountains. They, maybe it's water. Who knows? But they had to find a way to the mountains, then ultimately after that to the pole. And Shackleton estimated about 850 miles, uh, probably, uh, to the pole. And that would mean, if all went well, this was the estimate he made. Uh, they would take enough food for 91 days there and 91 days back. I know a, a total of 91 days, a six weeks there and six weeks back. So that's the idea. They loaded everything up uh, with enough food to actually make those time deadlines. And they thought they could do it. I mean, Shackleton did if they could make about 19 miles a day, 19 miles a day from Ross Island to the pole and back. And they had to be back by March 1st, 1909, because that's when the Nimrod, which would have been visiting them again during the Antarctic summer, was scheduled to leave back for New Zealand. Nobody was expecting the Nimrod to stay over the winter. It would crack up in the ice. So they were going to come back, pick everybody up, and by March 1st, they were going to go back. So that's when Shackleton had to be back to Ross Island by March 1st at all events, uh, 1909. Everything depended on the four Manchurian ponies. <laughs> But under the best of circumstances, ponies don't maintain heat anywhere near as well as dogs did, as Nonsen and everybody else well knew. And these ponies, as I just said, had no horseshoes. Very quickly, where there was ice, they slipped. And that meant that Shackleton and the others had to cut little ridges in the ice so they would have firmer footing as they continued in the very first days of their trip across the ice shelf. And then, the snow became thicker on the ice, but that made things worse. If you were dogs, you could scamper across the little film of ice on top of the snow, and everything would be fine. You could pull the sleds that way, but that's not what ponies could do. Ponies were too heavy, and these ponies went into the snow, of course, uh, right up maybe about this part of their legs, uh, very deep into the snow. They had to pull their uh, legs out of the snow, then back into the snow, then out of the snow, and that was going to slow them down considerably as well, uh, even as the ponies were consuming food, the maize that took up a big part of the load on those sleds. And it was not long, not long before, uh, in the early November, the first of the ponies uh, began to give out. And nobody knew if they could ever get to the pole if they had less than four ponies. They began to make a little bit better progress by the middle of November, still on the ice shelf. And then, to their delight, on November 16th, they passed 80 degrees south. They're close to Scott Shackleton in Wilson's record of 82. And they were making better time than Scott had made with the Discovery Expedition, despite the fact that the ponies were not going as fast as they hoped. Hmm. On November 26th, they made a new record, passed 82 degrees 18, farther south, farther south than the other three had gotten on the Discovery Expedition. And they've done it in 29 days. Not bad. Not quite according to schedule. But Shackleton put everybody on meager rations, cut the rations, maybe on less rations, we can still get there and back. At least Shackleton was willing to try. Now, one of the bad things, though, was just in the middle of all of this, they're still on the ice shelf, getting closer to the mountains. And in the middle of it, Seamus and Adams came down with a toothache. And it was a really bad toothache. Eventually, Dr. Marshall decided the tooth had to come out. Uh, he sat Adam's down on one of the sleds, had something that worked like forceps, but not quite forceps, uh, reached in there, began to pull out the tooth, and it cracked in half. Uh, now, some of, maybe some of this has happened to you. This happened to me on a dental chair, and I was in complete misery. The tooth cracked. And the dentist had to go back in there and get the rest of it out. Now imagine going through that on a sled on the Ross ice shelf <laughs> uh, with almost no anesthetic. Uh, and uh, it was so bad that they had to go fully the next day. Jameson would have a tooth in there before Marshall could take another look at it and try to get it out. And he finally did get it out. It's just a miserable experience. But they had the consolation of knowing. They had set the farthest self record You're beyond 82 degrees south on the ice shelf. Everything after this would be uncharted land. Everything after this would be unexplored. To Shackleton's great delight, uh, he had written to Emily, uh, you can't think what it is to walk where no one has walked before. Uh, and now that's what they were doing. And if the three ponies left could hold out, maybe they would be okay. 
but the three ponies did not hold them. Partly because ponies were not suited to these conditions anyway, partly because nobody knew how to manage them. These poor things, uh, during the night, uh, there'd be uh, two men to a tent, both of them in their sleeping bags. Shackleton, born leader, always rotated the people in the tent so little clicks would inform between this two and this two, people would rotate the tent mates. But that didn't help the ponies. The ponies were exposed to the elements, uh, the wind, the horrible temperatures. Uh, and somehow they endured, but this was asking too much of them. Uh, two more had to be shot on the ice shelf. They couldn't keep up, they couldn't keep going. And when the ponies were shot, they would be slaughtered and the meat would be put in depots so the men might have something to eat on the way back to Ross Island. They would take some of the meat with them, most of it though were put in these depots on the ice shelf. Their hunger was now increasing. The only good thing, maybe, about only having one pony left was now they could eat the maize, the feed that the ponies would otherwise eat. But that created its own problems because they needed something to, uh, like a mortar and pestle, uh, to, to, to bust out the hard kernels of the maize. So they had to keep picking up rocks to do that. And that would add weight, of course, to the sleds as they were pulling it down the ice shelf. But they could see beyond them, as you can see here on the map as well. Getting closer and closer, the great trans Antarctic mountains. They were going to have to find a way through that. They were happy to see it and that they were making progress, but how on earth, with their energy and their diminishing food and only one pony, were they ever going to get the sledge over those mountains? They must have had some very bad moments thinking about that. But then, as they got into the foothills of the mountains, Shackleton's luck all of a sudden turned. They began to pull the sleds up this little peak, uh, and Sox, which, which was the last pony, was doing the best they could pulling these sleds up the peak. They got up to 2,000 feet in this one early outlier of the Transarctic Mountains. And then they could see off in the distance from that 2,000 foot peak, and what they saw was one of the great supreme moments in the history of human exploration. We go to the next slide. What they saw was a glacier leading right through the mountains, right through the mountains, on the way to the polar plateau. It was going to be a lot of miles. The glacier was going up and up and up. It wasn't going to be easy, but they wouldn't have to climb a 14,000 foot peak. They could just follow the glacier and they would be finally, and they could see glimmering in the distance on the polar plateau. Last stop on the way to the South Pole. And they could actually see the glimmering in the sky, the glow in the sky which was the sun reflecting off the vast polar plateau and back into the air. And that was their destination. They had stumbled upon the one best route to the South Pole. And they had stumbled on it because Shackleton had gone a little bit further east on his track than Scott was going to go. And that's how they got exactly where they needed to go. And naturally, in his delight, Shackleton named this glacier uh, after Beardsmore. And it is still the Beardsmore Glacier, a famous in Antarctica. A lot of people, including including his biographer, Randall Fines, thinks that he might have named the Beersmore Glacier after Eliza Beersmore, uh, who was Mr. Beersmore's wife, who uh, Shackleton knew before he knew the husband. But we'll never know. It's just the Beersmore Glacier. One great sheet of ice, and beyond it, the South Pole. So down off the peak, after hauling everything up, then back down, they went, and on to the glacier, which was the way to the pole. And by the way, before we go any further, Shackleton liked naming things after females. Uh, he had met somebody, struck up a friendship with this woman named Donaldson while he was in New Zealand for a few days. Uh, and so now there's a Mount Donaldson uh, in the Trans Antarctic Range just because he met this woman uh, when he was in New Zealand. Uh, well, it was hard work uh, getting everything up uh, onto the glacier. Uh, Socks beginning to suffer very much pulling these loads. Uh, but it was such hard work that even though this was Antarctica, it's the middle of the summer. The sun was beating down on them. They found themselves taking off their coats and working in their sleeves and chewing on little frozen bits of horse meat just to keep cool. It was such hard work to get everything up onto the glacier to begin with. But they finally got it there. And now the only thing they had to worry about, it's now the beginning of December, uh, 1908. And the only thing they had to worry about on the glacier was what you all have to worry about on glaciers. That is stepping in a crevasse, 
and they never knew every single step, every single point the sleds went, whether that would be the last step they'd ever take. They couldn't see very much in front of them. It's covered with layers of snow. A crevasse would mean doom. And we all knew that. Every step, as Shackleton said, was an adventure and not a fun adventure either. But that's the way to go. So that's where they went. On December 7th, unfortunately, Socks luck ran out. Uh, Socks stepped in a crevasse. Well, Socks was pulling one of the sleds down into the great abyss. Socks fell. Luckily, she didn't, he didn't, I think it was he, uh, didn't take the sled with him. The tether broke just at the right time. So Socks went down, but the sled stayed. And it's a good thing it did because, among other things, on that sled were two sleeping bags. So two of the men would have died for sure uh, if that sled had gone down in there. But it held on the very rim of the crevasse, expanded just at the right place. They could pull it off and they saved their supplies. But this was a terrible thing. Uh, this hit them emotionally, the death of Socks. Socks they'd gotten to know very much like. So one of the men wrote this noble little Socks. He died in harness, like the true soldier he was. Died in harness. The bad thing about this was no more ponies. They would have to manhaul these sleds all the way to the South Pole and back. And also, in addition to that, they couldn't survive on Sox meat. The meat was gone. It's down there in the abyss. This was a big blow against them. But typically, they went on. Down the glacier, and I should say up the glacier, because now we're going from 2,000, 3,000, 6,000, 7,000 feet. They're hauling these sleds further and further up the glacier. The air was getting thinner. It was getting harder and harder to pull. But they weren't going to give up, at least not yet. And they had one moment of discovery that uh, has stood the test of time. Frank Wilde, at some point, happened to notice strange bits of rock formations as they were going up the glacier. And he took a closer look at them, and it turned out to be coal. These were coal which meant, of course, that there were resources in Antarctica, and especially that Antarctica used to be warm. So it used to be cold there if there had been living things at some point. Here in the Transarctic Mountains, it's a big discovery, and they would bring that back to England with them as one of their achievements. But they weren't all that worried about the cold now. Uh, they were worried about hunger. They were worried about frostbitten fingers as they went up the glacier. They were worried about bouts of snow blindness that really afflicted Shackleton more than anybody else. And sometimes when the snow blindness would get too bad, they would take little bits of cocaine and they would put it in their eyes uh, just to maybe make themselves a little bit better. I'm not sure how well they did, but, but that's what, what they would do. And what was what made it even worse was the third bit of advice that Nansen gave Shackleton that he didn't listen to. Uh, the third bit of advice was you should wear fur in Antarctica. Fur is what the Inuits wore. Fur is what Perry wore. Fur is what Cook wore in Nansen and Amundsen. And all the great North Pole explorers wore fur. They learned that from the people who lived there. The great thing about fur is that it creates nice little pockets of warmth between the fur and your skin. You're fine in fur, but that's not what these guys were wearing. They had these gabardine uh, coverings over them, and then woolen sweaters and woolen undergarments. And you know what that means? Uh, the wool would capture the sweat on their body. The sweat would freeze, and they would be in a mess of discomfort, all because Shackleton would listen to nonsense. All of this was, was needless. But they were suffering needlessly because of this. And to make matters even worse, the farther they got up the glacier, now it's going to be 10,000 feet. Imagine pulling these sleds, weary as they were, hungry as they were, at 10,000 feet. And don't forget, Shackleton's got a heart condition. It was unbelievable. And they were still in the glacier. He could have collapsed at any moment. They really needed about 6,000 calories a day for this. They were getting about 2,500 calories at best a day because they had cut their rations long since, not able of getting to the pole in back. On they went. They celebrated Christmas still on the Beersmark Glacier, now at 86 degrees south. Once more, Shackleton had a surprise. Fun pudding for the men, cigars. They had a grand old time. But they were 250 miles away from the pole, and Shackleton had to cut rations even more. Strange and unbelievable as that may be. The wind was in their faces. The wind was up to 50, 60 miles an hour very often uh, in this trip. But they kept going. The blizzard on December 30th was so bad they had to stop. 
agonizing torment, knowing they were losing a day, uh, stopping in their tent. But they couldn't hear each other talk. The wind was so loud at over 80 miles an hour by now. And then the next day is New Year's Eve. They kept going, and now they were within sight of the end of the glacier at long last. And the great day came. I think it was the afternoon of December 31st. The glacier was over, and they could see directly before them the polar plateau. See, 11,000 feet, it's very high, but no more major crevasses. Maybe they could actually make it. Shackleton said to himself, 12 days. 12 days to get to the pole. 12 days is all we need. Then maybe, if everything went well, we get back to Ross Island in time to meet the Nimrod. The deadline, remember, is March 1st. They were tantalizing these folks. By now, they were scarecrows, chap skin, beards, uh, weary beyond words. But they were so close. The adrenaline was there. They could keep going. Maybe they were beyond 87 degrees south. Far more, five degrees more than Scott had gotten with Shackleton and Wilson uh, in 1902. The highest latitude ever achieved, north or south, 87 degrees. They've done it. But the frostbite was getting worse. And they were so weary that they could only take a few steps and they'd fall down. A few steps and they'd fall down. But they wouldn't give up. Following those heavy sleds, they wouldn't give up. Then it was January 2nd. They made disappointing progress that day. And somewhere in his tent, in his sleeping bag, Shackleton began to do the awful man. And he knew from sheer force of will, they could get to the pole. They could still do it. But the chances of ever getting back were now almost nil. They could make it, but they were too weak, too little food in the sleds to get back. They might make the first depot, maybe they'd never make the next one, which was at the beginning of the glacier. So he figured it might be time to end it. Wouldn't give up, he wouldn't admit it, not yet. It may be he thought that they could get to the pole, but nobody would ever know. <laughs> Someday somebody would find their corpses there or somewhere on the, on the plateau. We finally decided on, the, on January 3rd that they had to call it quits. They could not get to the pole. Everybody believes that if it was Sheriff Jacobin, he would have kept going and he would have left somebody to find him eventually. He would have died. He would have kept going at all costs. Uh, but he had three other guys to think about, three other families. Uh, there's no way he was going to put them in jeopardy. They all would have fallen, uh, but he wasn't going to ask for them. So he made what must have been the most difficult decision of his life. Uh, he decided not to go to the pole. And then he made a terrible decision, an absolutely terrible decision. He knew he couldn't get to the pole out of the question. But what he decided to do was go a little further so he could say he'd gotten within 100 miles of the pole. <laughs> He wanted to do that. Why? <laughs> if you can't get to the pole, uh, to me, it, it's, it's an awful, awful way of thinking. Uh, you're putting everybody in jeopardy still doing this, but they all said, yeah, we want to get within 100 miles of the pole. And so they decided to go a little bit further than where they were. Uh, even though he had achieved a record for himself and a lot of other things, uh, they wanted to get within 100 miles. So they left one little bit of depot at the space they were. They took a few biscuits, they took a few bits of chocolate, and on they went to try to get within 100 miles. And sure enough, the blizzards came up again. Sure enough, they're in the tents. They, they can't move. Uh, everything is going wrong that can go wrong. Uh, and the winds were so heavy, they, they couldn't even think of moving for about 36 hours. But then finally, the winds dropped a little bit. Uh, they kept going until Dr. Marshall, who was a map, he was a map maker, not just a doctor, certified that everybody's relief. We're 97 miles away. We did it. We're 97 miles away. Time to turn back. It was January 6th. And I, or look, I think maybe a couple of days after. For the first early second week of January, and they got to 88 degrees 23. 88 degrees 23. They needed to get to 90 degrees. They were at 88 degrees 23. It was 40 degrees below zero. They were about as tired as you could be, but they had that to think about. And now we go to the next slide. And what they did, here's what here they are. That's how close they got. I ate it. See how close. Almost there. Almost there. That's right. It's <laughs> funny you should say that. Uh, Frank Wilde later said that uh, if they'd gone one more hour 
after Marshall had said we're 97 miles away, they, they would probably all have died. Uh, that's how close they cut it. A while ago, we maintained that. So now we go to the next slide. This is what the Polo Plateau kind of looks like. And this is where they were, just one great plateau of whiteness. A few ridges, hillocks here and there, but it's mostly a plateau, one great expanse of white. Now we go to the next slide. And here's the famous picture they took when they got as far as they were going to go. Uh, that flag was given to them by Queen Alexandra on the Nimrod, uh, just as they were starting out. And Shackleton was the one who took the picture. So I think it goes, I think that's Frank Wilde, that's Dr. Marshall, and that's Jameson Adams. Those are the other three. And you can see those are canvas coverings that they were wearing. Uh, they should have been in fur, as I said, but, but of course they weren't. And now all they had to do was walk 850 miles back. <laughs> That's all they had to do. Uh, and they really should never have made it. Uh, they got to that last little depot that they left before going to within 100 miles. They got what they could there. And the problem now was they had to get to the next depot, uh, right where the glacier uh, met the, the, the Great Plateau. And uh, that was going to take probably 17 days, but they only had maybe 10 days worth of food. So how were they going to do it? Okay. Probably 17 days, they got only 10 days worth of food. Uh, Shackleton, however, had gambled, and his gamble paid off. Uh, the gamble was that all the way to the pole, the wind had been in their faces. The wind had become from the south. They were struggling against that wind the whole time. Now they were going to go back north. The wind would be at their backs. So why not attach sail to the sleds? Uh, let the wind propel the sleds, and we'll pull them when we have to. We'll run alongside the sleds when we can. To the extent that they couldn't run, they'd always be falling down, picking themselves back up. And the gamble paid off. The wind was at their backs. And that's how they made it against all odds, uh, an incredible uh, 20 miles a day on average, all the way back to the glacier. Could they find the depot with a bunch of snow around? Could they find the place where they left the food? That's what they were all wondering. But after making really good time with the wind at their backs, they did, as a matter of fact, find the depot they had to find. They uh, ate what they could at the first depot, and then it was back down the glacier, across the mountains, and eventually to the Ross ice shelf. They really needed to get to the next depot if they were going to succeed and they were going to live. But for now, it was a calculus of depot, depot, depot. Can we make the next one? Can we make the next one? It's getting into January. Uh, February is right around the corner, and they've got to get back by March 1st. Otherwise, it's another winter in the Antarctic. They've got to get back by March 1st. This is when in the glacier, their progress began to slow. They're, they're going downhill. The wind was at their backs, and that meant they fell. They kept falling, up, falling, up, falling. The pemmican was gone that they were used to depending on. Only one of the last things they had to eat were these pills that Dr. Marshall had brought along. The pills were called forced march. Some of you may have heard about that. A forced march were pills part caffeine, part cocaine. Uh, and they would take these forced march pills. That would give them a little bit of energy, at least to get themselves up in the morning, but not much more than that. And then Jameson Adams collapsed. Uh, he couldn't make it, couldn't go another step. He needed food, and there wasn't any food, just these pills. Now, they knew a depot was a little bit in uh, their path. They did, didn't know precisely if they could find it, but they knew it was out there somewhere. And the only person with enough help to try to find it was Dr. Marshall. So he courageously set out alone to try to find the depot. Uh, he fell down, dug himself out of a couple of crevasses, got to the depot, loaded himself up on food, had the willpower not to eat ravenously when he got there, just had a couple little lumps of sugar. And Dr. Marshall always said, two lumps of sugar beats forced marsh any day. Give me sugar, mm -hmm. not cocaine. <laughs> uh, so back up he went, and he found the other three who were in their tents, and he provided them with food, and all of them said that was the best meal they had in their lives because they not only had food, they also had fuel. They could cook the horse meat. They could have some pemmican. And best of all, for the first time in ages, they had hot tea. They all said best meal of their entire lives, uh, right there on the glacier. And that meant they wouldn't die. They wouldn't die in the Beersmore Glacier. At least that's what that meant. But they were still weak. 
still skin and bones, and it's still off to the next people. We make the next one, we make the next one. Um, they got to the point, this is the end of January, and Frank Wilde now was about to give out. Uh, he's starving, almost starving. They haven't gotten to the people, the next one, but they had to. Uh, and so knowing that he didn't have much left within him, uh, Shackleton decided to give up one of his last precious biscuits so that Frank Wilde could live. Uh, and this is what Frank Wilde said. Uh, this is the last night in January. Uh, we're still on the glacier. Shackleton privately, wouldn't tell anybody else, Shackleton privately forced upon me his one breakfast biscuit and would have given me another had I allowed him. I do not suppose that anyone else in the world can thoroughly realize how much generosity and sympathy was shown by this. I do, and by God, Frank Wilde said, I shall never forget. Thousands of pounds would not have bought that one biscuit, uh, but Shackleton gave it to him to save him of his own free will. Now it's February. They're through the mountains. Finally, they're over the glacier. They're back on the ice shelf. We got to get to Ross Island. We got 250 miles to go. Through superhuman will, they kept going because now they had another threat dysentery. Some of the horse meat they'd eaten had not been good, had been cooked properly. And so all of them had dysentery. All of you, at some point, I, I know I have, you might have had a bad case of the flu. And you know how that is. You're in bed. You gotta get up, you gotta make a sandwich or something. You don't want to get up, you don't want to get up, but you make yourself somehow get up and go to the kitchen, and it's all you can do. These guys had dysentery, they're in the Antarctic, they're pulling sleds, uh, they're skin and bones that they're not eating, they got all manner of frostbite, and they're getting up every day and every hour after falling, even though it took a supreme act of will for all of them to do it uh, with the dysentery and everything else they were now suffering from. And every now and then, the only thing that gave them a little bit of hope was they could scrounge, uh, maybe find a little bit of food they didn't think was there. And when it was Shackleton's birthday, they did some scrounging and they found just enough little bits of tobacco to make him a cigarette. Uh, and that was Shackleton's birthday present on February 13th uh, on the Ross High Shelf. A terrible realization was now dawning on them. It's the middle of February. Uh, and now they knew, Shackleton knew. They couldn't get back to Cape Woods. Uh, they didn't have the strength. Uh, the food wasn't there for, for that to happen. They had to get to Cape Woods, but they couldn't. It wasn't going to happen. But they had one hope. Before leaving Ross Island, Shackleton had left instruction for his uh, fellow members of the expedition. Uh, I want you guys to go out to a place called uh, Min's Bluff. Uh, Minna Bluff. Minna Bluff. When we go to the next slide, and there's, there's another map as you can see. At this point, it's the middle of February. Uh, they're about there. We're pretty far away still from Ross Island. And now we go to the next slide. There's Ross Island. Imagine a point of land about here on the ice shelf. That's Minna Bluff. Pretty far away from Cape Boyce, but closer to the members of the expedition, Shackleton and the other three. Than Cape Boyd was. And they figured they could make it to Minna Bluff. They could make it that far, maybe. Because Shackleton, remember, uh, had talked to his fellow expedition members back at Cape Boyd's, and he had told them, at some point, you need to put a depot at Minna Bluff, just in case I need it. Now, he didn't know if they followed the instructions. He had left a lot of instructions that they ignored. <laughs> this was the one that might keep him alive. If they had actually listened to him and left food at Minna Bluff, they could just get there. They could just live. But if they had not listened to him, that would be their death. No food. They now staked everything on getting to Minna Bluff. Again, it's a bit self, about right there uh, on the Antarctic map. The temperatures were now 35 degrees below zero. The winds were heavy, blowing into their shaft places. <clears throat> Their bones ached and racked them at every step. On February 21st, they ate the last morsel of food they had. The next day, they felt they could just make it to Minna Bluff, but there was literally no food. If there was no food at the bluff, they died. But every single hour of the next day, they're getting closer to the bluff, and they all know that could be it. That could be it for them. If the food wasn't there. 
It got to one o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock in the afternoon. They can't find a depot. They're on the bluff now. They can't see a depot. Where's the food? This lot of blowing snow, it was probably obscured. How are they going to find it even if it's there? And then at 4 p.m., all of a sudden, Dr. Marshall could see a little glitter of light, a little flash. That's that. And they went closer to the little glitter of flash, and it turned out to be a tin of biscuits. The sun has shone on a tin of biscuits. The men had followed their orders. They left the food at the depot. The men found it, and guess what they ate now? Home pudding, eggs, mutton, delighted. They now could at least get a new burst of strength. And even as the blizzard was raging around them, it was now February 22nd, and they still had six days to try to get to Cape Boys. Six days to meet the Nimrod. And that was their last challenge. So they set out after eating what they could at Minnabla. They set out north, as you see here, for Cape Boys to try to meet the Nimrod. Uh, and it turned out, though, that Marshall and Adams now couldn't keep up. All the food they had at the bluff wasn't enough. They were too sick. The weakness was too profound. They couldn't go any further after three days. There was only one thing to do. Wild and Shackleton would have to go as far as they could in the next three days and try to find the Nimrod and then bring help back to the two left in the tent, Adams and Marshall. What uh, Shackleton told the Wild to keep his spirits up if you got a difficult task, you leave it to the old guys. Mm -hmm. And we're both 35. Mm -hmm. You leave it to the, they're older than the other two. You leave it to the old guys. And so they trudged into the snow and the ice. And they got, finally, at the end of February, they got to a, a promontory, so February 27th or so, uh, right here, a little bit south of Ross Island. And they began uh, setting off these signals. They, they tried to use like a heliotrope, they tried to use a mirror. Got a signal the Nimrod if it was anywhere out there. No reaction. Nobody seems to have saw them. So one more day, February 28th. They got here to Hut Point. That's where Big Myrtle Station is now. The southernmost point of Ross Island. This is their last chance. If the Nimrod doesn't see them here, they're lost. Another winter in the Antarctic. They couldn't get to Cape Royce. They could only get as far as Hut Point. So at this point, Shackleton and Wilde saw a little hut right there on the point, and they set it on fire. And although their fingers would barely move by now, they managed to hoist the Union Jack up a flagpole, hoping the Nimrod would see it. So the fire starts burning, up goes the Union Jack. Shackleton and Wilde are looking out into McMurdo Sound. The Nimrod was about to start on its way home. It was now the morning of March 1st, actually, morning of March 1st. And at the last possible moment, somebody on the Nimrod saw a little bit of smoke. And the smoke was coming up almost at the very point where Vince's cross was, the cross I showed you last time, the first fatality of the Discovery Expedition. Somebody saw it, alerted the captain, the Nimrod rounded Cape Royce, rounded up a little bit, peninsula about that point, and Wilde and Shackleton could see the Nimrod coming right at them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they went wild with joy. And on the Nimrod, grown men were literally dancing with each other for joy. They had found the man everybody called the boss. Shackleton was there on her point. One last challenge remained. Tired as he was, famished as he was, Shackleton insisted on meeting men from the Nimrod back where Marshall and Adams were, near death in their tent. Everybody was rescued, and the Nimrod was ready to go home by November 3rd, by March 3rd. Now we go to the next slide. And there they are. Uh, this is what they look like uh, at the very end. So that's uh, from left to right. Uh, that's Frank Wilde, that's Shackleton, that's Dr. Marshall, and that's Jameson Adams. Uh, and they would go home heroes, but especially Shackleton, would now be Sir Ernest Shackleton. He'd be a poor hero. He didn't make the money he thought he would make on those lecture tours. He depended on the British government ultimately to bail him out of most of his debts. But he had achieved three great firsts. 
Number one, they come on Erebus the first time. Number two, they got within 100 miles of the pole farther south. And number three, Mawson and Professor uh, Edgeworth David had actually gone to the South Magnetic Pole while everybody else was in the Trans-Arctic Mountains of the Beardmore Glacier. So those were the three great firsts of this expedition, one of the greatest in the annals of Arctic exploration. But we haven't gone to the South Pole yet. Uh, so the next two sessions, we're going to finally get there. So uh, we'll pick up the story then. It seems to me that the discovery of the glacier to get through the mountains would have been right up there with one of the accomplishments. A huge, a huge discovery. Mm -hmm. and that's the way to go. Future expeditions would know that, that this is the way to go. That's right. So they found the route. They didn't get there, but they found the route to get there. Yeah. At least one route, as we'll see. Go ahead. So why did Shackleton go to speak with Manson in the first place? Mm -hmm. that he wanted to so that's a very good question. <laughs> I've often wondered that. Uh, I think that well, Nansen was there anyway because he was the ambassador. Uh, he was giving a speech at the Royal Geographic Society. Shackleton happened to be there at, at the same speech. Uh, so, so maybe it was an encounter that Shackleton didn't necessarily bank on or count on. But it was during that encounter that he saw fit to ignore every good. Why would you ignore advice from this guy? I have no idea. Uh, so, so you want to talk to Einstein, but ignore anything about general relativity. He doesn't know about that. <laughs> so it never made any sense to me. Mm -hmm. They're lucky to survive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he heated it up in what came to be called the Trans Antarctic Expedition that never quite made it. That was the famous endurance expedition. Uh, so he, he appreciated dogs and water by then. That's been everybody else. So, so uh, if I think the usual rule, a lot of people have said this, but the usual rule is that uh, if you really want to get where you need to go in the Arctic regions, you listen to Amundsen or Nansen. Uh, but if you like to have fun on the way, you listen to Shackleton. <laughs> you no matter what happens, you'll survive. He's going to make sure you survive. <laughs> Maybe by the skin of your teeth, but you will survive. <laughs> what was the word? Rogue Island. Rogue Island. Oh, they went around Cape Horn. Because um, they had enough coal to do that, but they loaded up so many new supplies in Australia and New Zealand that they didn't have enough coal to get there and back on the new bottom. And that's why they take a little coal, and that's why they had to be towed. But they, but they had enough coal to go around the horn to a Sydney and then to Christchurch. Mm -hmm. Anybody else go ahead? Have this, but I wonder if the bricks made it chilling on the brick. Yeah, and, and well, that, that's the key to the whole thing. I guess don't, don't forget this is the Edwardian era, and they put a lot of stock in just what you said grips to determination and showing what humankind can do. Uh, it would not have occurred to the Norwegians to believe there's something admirable about man hauling a sled. If you can do it by dogs, do it that way. It's a lot easier. The dogs would even mind it that much. But you hope you always do it by dogs. But to the Edwardians, no, that wouldn't be such a great achievement. We've got to pull this list. Other things. So it, it was impractical. But that was the Edwardian spirit in the last days of the empire. And that's the Edwardian spirit that would eventually prove disastrous to a whole generation in World War I, of course. Uh, maybe not learning from all the mistakes. Uh, that others have made. Uh, but there's, there's a sense, I suppose, in which that kind of heroism is difficult to understand today, but it was second nature to them. And that was also the heroism that uh, eventually led to disaster on the slopes of Mount Everest, uh, right after World War I, uh, during the early expeditions there. So maybe, maybe next year we can talk about those expeditions. Um, uh, but the Norwegians, the Americans, were a lot more practical. Oh, and by the way, the whole thing about how Somebody has some sort of proprietary right to a certain route or a certain base. It's absolutely absurd. Absolutely absurd. Nobody thought that among the Americans. Harry would go up Smith Sound on the left coast of Greenland to try to get to the North Pole. Four other explorers have taken the same route, tried to get as far as they could. He saw nothing wrong with taking. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you learn from what other people have done? 
But this, this whole idea that Scott had some right to McMurdo, it, it's outrageous. Uh, but there was that sense of honor among the Edwardians, misplaced sense of honor that covered this. And Wilson, uh, to his dying day, thought that Shackleton did the wrong thing. If he couldn't get to Edward VII, he should have gone home. Stupid. But, but that's the way they thought. <laughs> Oh, and uh, the, the, the um, Fine's book, Reinhold Fine's book on Shackleton is really good. Uh, he's an anarchist for him, so he's really well about Shackleton. And uh, this is also a good book. Uh, Bo Rippenberg's book on the Nimrod expedition. There's a lot of good anecdotes in here. Uh, gotten through the Minuteman system uh, anytime you want. So I uh, commend both of those if you want to read further about this. Uh, we're, we're not going to see much more of Shackleton, but we'll see a lot of Scott and Allen uh, over the next two weeks. And maybe Douglas Mawson. Uh, Douglas Mawson, who got to the top of Mount Erebus, may have been the single greatest explorer of them all. Uh, so I'm hoping to bring him up during our last presentation. Okay. Yeah, so, so the whole Endeavor story is fantastic, even though it didn't hit the North Pole. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But well, the, the endurance, right? And the, what did I say? Endeavor. Oh, endeavor. <laughs> no, no, it's Captain Cook's ship. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, the endurance story is unbelievable. Uh, but that's after the South Pole, so you probably want to get there. Okay, great. Hope to see you in the next